good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brett Bush, and today I'm going to be sharing the story of how our team leveraged open API specification testing to adopt an API-driven development model, and as a result, seamlessly scale our developer relations program. Let me, yeah. There we go. Uh, before we dive in, I'll share a bit about myself and my company. Again, I'm Brett Bush. I work at Logigate, which is based in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer, and over the last two years, I've been leading and building out our developer relations program. Uh, my background has been in APIs and SDK development, which ultimately led me to developer relations. Uh, and in leading our developer relations program, I've become involved with open API specifications, API-first development, and API documentation. As far as Logigate, we're in the industry of GRC, governance, risk, and compliance, and we deliver a holistic no-code GRC platform so organizations can proactively understand, manage, and mitigate their ever-changing risk and compliance landscapes. Uh, we have a SaaS platform called the Risk Cloud, and as a SaaS platform, we provide APIs for building out custom integrations. Hence the need for a developer relations program to begin our journey to an API-first approach. However, shifting to an API-first model can be an uphill climb. According to Postman's 2023 State of the API report, 75% of participants agree that developers at API-first companies are more productive. So there's a large incentive to adopt an API-first model. However, only 11% ranked themselves as highly API-first. So how do these companies in the 75% that acknowledge the productivity benefits of an API-first model become API-first themselves? Well, like many software development answers go, it depends. Every company is at a different stage in their journey and is starting from a different place, which leads to our journey. Our team's API started out as code first, where the code base of our API used API documentation generation libraries to generate our open API specification from the code base, which could in turn be used to generate our API documentation. The code was developed before the API, with our open API specification and documentation essentially being improvised off of the code base. However, like many organizations, we wanted to shift to API first, where the API is developed before the code. For this, it meant putting the open API specification as the central source of truth, informing the design of the code base as well. However, we soon realized that the code base could change independently of the API documentation, causing a disconnect between the two. In addition, by not leveraging the API documentation libraries in our code base to generate the open API specification, we lost a fair amount of convenience that we had before. What we desired wasn't just a code-first approach or an API-first approach, but what we would call an API-driven approach, where similar to API-first, the API is developed before the code. However, alignment is guaranteed between the API and the code as well. So from our starting point of code first, how do we manage the trade-offs of transitioning our open API specification from being improvised from our code base to becoming aligned and an aligned and central source of truth across our entire development process? With our starting point being improvised, let's envision this in another improvisational setting. Improvised jazz. Let's say we are in a jazz band, and here's our performance process. For our band, our musicians are the source of our music. The performance of our music is the production, and the sheet music that is transcribed from the performance is the output. Along with any variations of the sheet music, such as including other musicians to perform the piece or exporting the sheet music to a digital setting. We're happy as a jazz band with the existing qualities of our performance process. However, our goal is that we want to share our music with the world through our sheet music, which we're currently unable to do. However, we can how can we preserve the benefits we currently have as an improvised jazz band while also achieving our goals? Let's walk through each quality of our performance process and see the trade-offs that we'll need to make. The first quality that we enjoy as a jazz band is that our performance is direct. Being direct means that there's convenience in how the musicians create the performance and that the performance is transcribed directly from the sheet music. Next, our performance is flexible. If a musician notices that the performance would be better if their part were louder or softer, this would reflect in the transcribed sheet music of the performance. 
And finally, as a jazz band, we like knowing that the sheet music that is transcribed from the performance will always be accurate, provided, of course, that we have a very talented transcriptionist. However, as a jazz band, there's some room for improvement. For instance, our performance process does not guarantee a singular, sheet, uh, a singular piece of sheet music. Our musicians can perform any number of performances, with each producing slightly different variations of the sheet music. Additionally, our performance process does not have sheet music available at any given time, as a full performance and transcription is necessary before sheet music is available. With generating sheet music being an inconvenient and time-consuming task, this impacts our ability to share the sheet music with other musicians or export it to a digital setting. And finally, if a musician unintentionally makes a mistake, this mistake would be recorded into the final sheet music, which would have a ripple effect to other musicians performing the piece or exporting it digitally. So with these goals in mind, what's one step we could take to making this sheet music and performance process more singular, available, and intentional? Well, currently the performance is developed before the sheet music, so let's try flipping it around where the sheet music is developed before the performance. Now that we've written the sheet music out first and have given it to our musicians, we achieve our goals of singularity and availability by having a single source of truth on hand. However, the performance of the sheet music may still not be intentional, given that the musicians can still make mistakes. With the possibility of mistakes, that also means there's no guarantee that the sheet music the musicians have and the sheet music transcribed from the performance are the same. How can we ensure that the musicians perform the music as intended without making any mistakes? Well, we could replace all the musicians with robots. With robots performing the music, we achieve all of our goals. We have a single source of sheet music. The sheet music is composed ahead of time and is readily available. And we can guarantee that the sheet music will always be performed as intended, since again, it's being performed by robots. However, in replacing human musicians with robots, we lose a level of musicality. And which ultimately affects the flexibility of the performance that we had before. For example, if we want a part of the music to be louder or softer, the robot musician would disregard any level of nuance in favor of following the score note for note. That means that any musicality details and nuance would need to be written directly into the sheet music ahead of time, which could become very time consuming and complex. So let's take a step back from robots and reflect on where we are. We want to have our sheet music composed and available, and we have a feeling it's a step in the right direction, but we need something to align the sheet music across our whole performance cycle. Well, picturing this group performing on a stage, there's a key member that it feels like we're missing, a conductor. A conductor has the ability to internally transcribe the sheet music from the performance in real time and verifies its alignment with their golden copy of the sheet music, called the score. Now, the sheet music is developed before the performance, but alignment is also guaranteed between the performance and the sheet music. It's direct in that it's convenient for the uh, to perform for the conductor who can transcribe in real time. It's flexible where if the musician notices that the performance would be better if their part were louder or softer, the conductor would notice this difference, but can act as a mediator to update the score to reflect the positive change. The performance will also always be aligned with the tr conductor's transcription and in turn, the score itself. There's also a singular source of truth for the sheet music as represented by the score. The score itself is also available at any time for either sharing with another musician or exporting digitally. Additionally, it's circularly available as sheet music for the performing musicians themselves. And while the conductor serves as a flexible mediator for productive changes, if there's unintentional mistakes, the conductor can detect them and indicate that should, they should be addressed, keeping the golden copy of the score preserved as intended. With our goals of availability, singularity, and intentionality in mind, we've come a long way from our original process of improvised jazz, from a performance-driven approach to a score-driven approach with the help of our conductor and score. Now, you may be asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with APIs? And that's a good question. Well, while we've walked through the, through the journey of this jazz band, adopting a score-driven approach through their conductor and score, this is the same journey our team took when adopting an API-driven approach. However, instead of a source of musicians, a production of our performance, and an output of sheet music, this was actually our code-first approach, where the code was developed before the API. 
Instead of musicians, our source is API code. Instead of our performance, our production is the live API in production. And instead of sheet music, our output is an open API specification with the ability to export to tools like API documentation or Postman. So with this shift, let's recap what we tried with the Jazz Band to achieve the goal of having a singular, available, and intentional open API specification to serve as the source of truth in our development process. We tried API first, quite literally, by developing the API design first and having it inform the API code like sheet music. And for a time, this gave us a singular and available copy of what we wanted to develop. However, just as with our jazz band, intentionality was still lacking. And as code is updated, although following an open API specification when developing is a great guide, there's nothing preventing unintended API changes from making it into production. So again, how can we ensure that the open API specification is honored? Taking inspiration from our robot approach from earlier, we could generate all the API code from the open API specification using a code generator tool. This ensures that our, our goal of intentionality is met since the production API and generated open API specification will always reflect that core open API specification. However, given that we're a SaaS platform, generating our API entirely from an API specification would cost us the flexibility of our application's business logic, meaning new features would need to be built entirely from within the open API specification as opposed to in the, a code base. And while it would be really cool to replicate the entire nuance of our rep, web application with open API extension properties, it would unfortunately be very time consuming and complex. So here we are stepping back to API first, trying to balance the trade-offs of a code first approach and an API first approach we need to call our friend the conductor. And in this case, our conductor and score is instead an integration test and a main static and golden copy of our open API specification. Just as the conductor served as a mediator and validator between the performed sheet music and the score, the integration test validates alignment between the generated open API specification and the main open API specification. And as the score served as a source of truth for the sheet music, the main open API specification serves as a static per commit reference of the API at any given moment in time. With this approach, we balance code first and API first together, where the API is developed before the code and alignment is guaranteed between them, thanks to our integration test. Let's take a closer look at the integration test and the main open API specification. Our main open API specification lives in our code base alongside our production code. It's a static file, so there's no need to generate it. Since it doesn't require generation, it's also available for reference or testing at any given time. And thanks to our open API test, it accurately reflects the state of the API in the code base at any given time to the git commit. When we zoom into the code of the test, the open API test is only a few steps and could be refactored into a variety of code languages that have open API libraries available. The test here is written in Kotlin, and here are some of the steps of what it does. First, it creates an open API object based off the static main open API file in our code base. Next, it creates a second open API object from the open API file generated from our API. In this example, we're getting this file from an endpoint provided by our API documentation library. Then we test both open API objects for equality, which depending on the language and library can sometimes just be done with a default equal symbol or a dot equals method. Or you can test certain sections of the open API specification individually too. A bonus while you're testing this is you're able to test things in the open API specifications for formatting. This way you can ensure that every property is documented and that API design standards are met for things like camel case versus kebab case. That's not the only bonus though. With the existence of this uh, test makes any API first change to the open API specification an act of test-driven development. If you're familiar with test-driven development, it's a development model where tests are developed before the code. Similarly, API first is where the API is developed before the code. And with both the API and our open API test developed before code is written, 
Our API-driven approach can be thought of as a combination between these two models. As a result, we're able to gain the benefits of test-driven development in that we can update the open API specification to drive the implementation of the API. For example, in the screenshot here, a developer adding a new property can add all the details of uh, an API change to the open API specification prior to development, then make the code changes to meet this definition. This certainly doesn't replace functional testing, but it, deserve, but it serves as a design test to ensure that your code changes are aligned directly to what is planned for the, the design of the API. If the open API test detects an unexpected change that occurred during development, the test will fail. However, you now have the flexibility to determine whether you should update the code to fit that specification or whether the main specification itself should be updated, similar to our conductor updating the main score based on constructive feedback from a musician. With our main open API specification at the center of our development process, we've been able to leverage it in so many new exciting ways. We've improved our API documentation using open source tooling to generate it from our open API specification. We've released the open API specification itself on GitHub to share with customers. The API design can be defined ahead of development with our API-driven approach. With the test in place, we can also detect breaking changes in our API early before merging them into production. And on a, a individual merge request for code review, you can see all the API changes very clearly on the open API specification file itself. We've also gained the ability to share accurate release notes by using open source tools to take a diff between the open API specifications in our current version and the previous version of our releases. And finally, we've used the open API specification as the basis for our Postman collection to share with customers. So what's next? We're planning to leverage this open API specification to build client SDKs. We're looking to scale out API-driven development into our feature planning and ticket planning uh, to include on specific tickets to serve as a guide for development. And while this work, a lot of this work was focused on our public APIs, we'd love to see these benefits internally as well. So we're exploring how we can leverage this model for our internal API practices too. Overall, here are the takeaways that we learned. API first is a journey, not a destination. And it's a series of trade-offs from where you're at and how you're going to continue to prioritize API design in your development process. Next, open API specifications go a long way. And formalizing one as a single source of truth at any given time takes it even further, allowing you to unlock a lot of new opportunities. However, building out a process to have this single source of truth can be a challenge. And in our case, the solution was an API-driven development model. And on that note, our final takeaway uh, is the discovery of our API-driven development model, which combined test-driven development and an API-first approach, allowing us to leverage the best of code-first and API-first development. So once again, I'm Brett Bush. Uh, if you're interested in chatting more about API-driven development, DevRel, APIs in general, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, my website, or anytime during this conference. And if you're interested in leveraging our Risk Cloud platform to help with managing your cyber risk programs, check out Logigate as well. That's all for me. Thanks so much.